Hi, my name is Hyung Sop and now I'm third year PhD student in Colombia and as a part of my PhD candidates exam I would like to present my works on computational micropore mechanics for phase changing geomaterials. Rather than talking about the climate change I want to start my presentation with this photograph. Um, this picture shows how Muir Glacier in Alaska changed from 1941 to 2004. Um, by simply just looking at this picture, we can see how serious the climate change is. This figure shows that annual mean temperatures in Alaska has been increasing for the past 50 years, and IPCC's prediction based on their RCP scenarios shows that the temperature will keep continue to rise. Especially in cold region, the temperature rise will continuously degrade the permafrost, which not only involves the thawing-induced damage of infrastructures, but also the freezing-induced damages because of the extreme precipitation patterns and refreezing of the groundwater. Therefore, as a civil engineer, I would like to focus on modeling the phase-changing geomaterials for my PhD work. Modeling phase-changing geomaterials mean that I am going to model ice growth inside the geomaterials. Ice growth or melting in geological materials involve complex thermohydromechanically coupled processes. For example, um, we should consider micromechanics of the materials because of their particular nature. And we should consider different flow regimes and heat transfer mechanisms in frozen and unfrozen regions. And even the pattern of the ice formation inside the pore space. There exists a number of works that attempt to model this kind of behavior and they can be categorized into two. First option is to homogenize everything. The material is considered to be a Boltzmann continuum and adopt Darcy's law and Van Genichen equation to model its unsaturated behavior. This approach is computationally efficient but it innovatively sacrifices too much details. Second option is to conduct grain scale or pore scale simulations like discrete element or lattice Boltzmann method. This approach can preserve the details but it may not be realistic if we try to conduct a meter scale or larger scale simulation since it's computationally demanding. Therefore in this work I would like to strike the balance between the two which may preserve more details compared to the first option, but at the same time computationally more efficient compared to the second approach. As a third option, my PhD work adopts four major concepts. First one is to use higher order continuum mechanics in order to capture the micromechanical behavior. Second is the dual porosity concept, which enables us to model the detailed fluid flow while preserving the microstructures. Third one is the concept of thermal non-equilibrium, which may capture the heat transfer and heat exchange mechanisms in small scales. Finally, in order to model the evolution of the internal structure or phase transition while preserving numerical convenience, this work adopts the phase field method to model the evolving interface. Um, this entire slide illustrates the outline of my work. By considering my PhD work as a journey to computationally solve the ice growth problems, my work consists of multiple steps where at each step I can be equipped with the tools that I need. The very first step is to study the evolving interface in higher order continuum, focusing on the phase field fracture in micropolar materials. Next step is to focus on the dual porosity that possesses different flow regime in each system, and I will further extend this concept to model hydraulic fracture. In step three, we study the concept of thermal non-equilibrium in the dual porosity system, which explores the thermohydromechanically coupled processes of the material. Um, these three sections are either completed or ongoing works that will be completed very soon. And finally, as a future work, in final step, I will focus on modeling the ice growth by properly using all four ingredients that I gained. The first step for the ultimate goal is to be equipped with higher order theory. 
One example that requires higher order continuum theory with evolving interface is the phase field fracture in micropolar continuum. Um, in this section, I would like to talk about it, and this will be further extended to model micromechanics of the freezing geomaterials. Micropolar continuum is a subclass of micromorphic continuum. As you can see in this schematic figure, um, these fictitious arrows are called directors. If we consider rigid directors with rotations, the continuum is micropolar. If the directors can be only stretched, then it's micro-stretch continuum. If directors can be rotated and stretched at the same time, then it's called micromorphic continuum. And the study will focus on the micropolar material. Kinematics of micropolar materials can be characterized with two strain measures. One is the micropolar strain, and the other one is the microcurvature. Uh, therefore, unlike the classical Boltzmann continuum, the elastic energy of this material has this additional term where C and D are the constitutive moduli that contain material parameters. And as you can see, micropolar material possesses length scale parameters, meaning that micropolar material exhibits size dependent behavior in the elastic regime. Examples of the materials that can be modeled as a micropolar continuum are the ones that possess microstructures like geological materials like sand, silt, or sandstones, and even human bone or metamaterials. There exists a problem when modeling fracture in micropolar materials since phase field approach by nature possesses artificial length scale parameter in order to approximate the sharp interface. Um, this figure shows that the regularization length parameter affects the material's response, which may also be affected by the characteristic lengths if the material is micropolar. Therefore, if we use classical phase field fracture model in micropolar materials, then the two set of length scale effects will coexist and they will affect each other. In order to resolve this issue, this study attempts to take out the effect of artificial phase field length scale since we don't want the artificial one to affect the physical one. Um, the free energy functional can be expressed like this, where this GD is a quasi-quadratic degradation function, and this gamma D is the crack surface energy functional. Um, compared to the most widely used phase field fracture models, this approach requires two more parameters. One is the shape parameter P, which controls the effect of regularization length scale. So as P becomes larger, the material response becomes more and more insensitive to the artificial length scale. The other one is the threshold energy, which controls the elastic range of the material. Based on the energy functional, the governing equations can be obtained like this. Um, here, this sigma is called force stress, which becomes a Cauchy stress as micropolar length scale approaches to zero. And this MR is called couple stress, which is related to the moments per unit volume. In this study, we solve these equations with finite element method by using the operator split, meaning that at each time step, we solve the phase field equation first and then solve the balance of linear and angular momentum equations. We first tried to explore the effect of shape parameter P on the regularization length sensitivity. Our computational domain looks like this, and we applied displacement control load on the left. By setting the shape parameter to be 2.5, as shown in this figure, the resulting force displacement curves are affected by the phase field length scale. However, by setting the shape parameter to be 10, the material response become regularization length scale insensitive. This means that we are now able to correctly capture the micropolar size effect in the damage regime. Also, this result shows that our approach is able to tune the peak stress by varying shape parameter, which can be utilized to model up to obtain material parameters by solving inverse problems. 
Another interesting thing about micropolar material is that stress and strain are no longer symmetric. The skew symmetric part of the force stress depends on parameter kappa, which again depends on micropolar length scale. And also, Yavari et al. in 2002 tried to describe the crack propagation mechanism in micropolar materials. They insisted that particles near crack tip first resist micro rotation and separation. Then, if we apply more loading, micro rotational bonding between particles breaks and they start to rotate. Consequently, particles move apart and neighboring particles become next crack tip particles. Based on the non-symmetric stress and strain and Yavri's explanation, we tried to investigate the micropolar effects on the crack patterns. In order to do that, we solved the boundary value problem in a square domain with an initial notch. In this example, we conducted both tension and shear tests with different micropolar length scales. As shown in the figures below, the material stiffness tends to increase as micropolar length scale increases. And more interestingly, uh, in the shear test case, the material tends to behave like more brittle material as micropolar length scale increases. This is because of the different crack patterns due to the micropolarity. As you can see, we obtained exactly the same crack patterns in the tension tests, but obtained different patterns in the shear tests. The crack tends to bend counterclockwise as micropolar length scale increases. Based on the average explanation, explanation, our interpretation is that the crack path tends to bend in order to minimize the effort on breaking the micro rotational bonding, such that this tra crack trajectory is equivalent to the path that maximizes the energy dissipation. We also try to explore the effect of micropolarity based on the partition of strain energy density. As you can see, the strain energy density can be split into three different parts. First one is the Boltzmann part Psi B that purely depends on the displacement. Second one is the micro-rotational part Psi R that purely depends on the, display, uh, on the micro rotation. And the third one is the coupling part Psi C that depends on both the displacement and micro rotation. In order to investigate the role of each energy density part, we conducted a number of simulations with partially degrading the energy density. For example, um, if this set D only contains the part B, then it means that we are going to only degrade this Boltzmann energy. Whereas if the set D contains all B, C, and R, this means that all the, de all the energy densities are degraded at the same time. In order to explore the effects of each energy density part, we conducted a double edge notch test by prescribing the displacement at the top with an angle of 45 degrees, and here's the results. Um, if we degrade both Boltzmann and pure micro-rotational parts, um, this case tend to stimulate similar fracture patterns compared to partial Boltzmann degradation case at the beginning, but then start to propagate towards the notches. On the other hand, combined degradation that degrades the coupling part, the crack tends to kink towards the adjacent notch from the beginning, and then two cracks quasins towards each other after sufficient loading. By this numerical experiment, we found out that the pure Boltzmann energy mainly derives the crack growth, while coupling and micro-rotational energies affect crack kinking and curving. This numerical example also implies that considering only the low order Boltzmann continuum is not enough in order to generate complicated fracture patterns numerically. In summary, for the first time we resolved the length scale issues in modeling fracture in size dependent materials by adopting regularization lengths in sensitive phase field models. By exploring the effect of micropolarity, we observe that crack tends to bend in order to minimize the effort on breaking the micro-rotational bonding. And we also investigated role, the role of energy densities by conducting a number of simulations with partially degrading the strain energy density. 
Now I'm going to talk about our second step, which is about the dual porosity system modeled with coupled Stokes-Darcy flow and extending this concept to model hydraulic fracture. Um, this dual porosity system with different flow regimes will directly be used to model different flow, flow mechanisms in frozen and unfrozen regions. In this section, we focus on the dual porosity system, where we model free flow in one system and model porous medium flow in the other one. This concept is used to model buggy porous media or blood vessel systems, which have two different regions, depends on the size of the pores. For example, in buggy porous media, inside the large pores, which is called vugs, the fluid flow is modeled with either Navier-Stokes or Stokes equation, while Darcy's law is used to model fluid flow inside the matrix. In this study, we model free flow region with Stokes equation and pores medium flow region with Darcy's equation. This schematic figure shows the Stokes-Darcy system, which consists of two subdomains, BS and BD, separated by the sharp interface gamma star. In order to model the coupled flow, we should properly consider transmissibility conditions at the interface. The governing equations for coupled Stokes-Darcy flow looks like this. The flow inside the free flow region is governed by the Stokes equation, where this sigma fs indicates fluid stress that depends on pressure pfs and velocity wfs. On the other hand, porous medium flow region is governed by the Darcy's law, where velocity WFD and pressure PFD has linear relationship. The Stokes and Darcy's flow can properly be coupled along the interface by, in, by enforcing, the, enforcing three transmissibility conditions. The first constraint is the flow, flu, fluid flow continuity. The second one is the normal force equilibrium. And the third one is the well-known beavers joseph safman condition that balances tangential forces by considering the friction at the interface. Here, this parameter alpha SD is the frictional coefficient that describes the roughness of the interface. This coupled flow can be implemented by using um, two numerical subdomains and combine them together with the transmissibility conditions. However, the implementation becomes extremely difficult when this interface is evolving. In order to resolve this issue, this study adopts diffuse approximation of the sharp interface by using the phase field. The phase field itself can be regarded as a smooth approximation of Heaviside function and its gradient can be regarded as an approximation of Dirac delta function. This approach enables us to transform all the subdomain volume integrations into volume integration over the entire domain that appears in the weak form and surface integrals along the interface can also be transformed into a volume integrals by using the phase field. For example, if we want to integrate an arbitrary function g tilde inside the Stokes region, this is equivalent to integrating g tilde multiplied with the Heaviside function h over the entire domain, where we can approximate this integration by replacing h with the phase field d. Since we now have the phase field representation of the interface, we can extend this model into a hydraulic phase field fracture model. Based on the mixture theory, we assume that fluid velocities are now relative to that of solid, and we assumed liquefied solid inside the Stokes region so that the effective stress principle holds only in the Darcy region. Based on the assumptions, the governing equations now become like, th become like this. The fluid mass balance equations now become the balance equations for both solid and fluid, and we need two more equations that describe the linear momentum balances in both Stokes and Darcy region. In the Stokes region, the constitutive model of the solid is equivalent to that of fluid, while in the Darcy's region we adopt the effective stress principle. In order to model hydraulic fracture, the effective stress is degraded with the quadratic degradation function 
and we also need the phase field equation that models the evolution of the Stokes region. By using this new approach, the Stokes region now represents the damaged zone, whereas the Darcy region represents the undamaged porous matrix. We first conducted a numerical example to explore the effects of frictional coefficient. Um, this test case consists of a rigid fluid channel that is intercepted by a porous medium. For the flow in the channel, we prescribed a parabolic flow velocity on the inlet where the outlet pressure is set to be zero. Um, these figures over here show the effect of frictional coefficient on the flow pattern. These arrows indicate fluid velocities and as you can see, the arrows near the interface that are parallel to the flow path are affected by the frictional coefficient. As frictional coefficient becomes larger, the velocity profile along the line AA prime becomes sharper due to the friction at the interface and as a result, higher pressure builds up inside the domain. We now focus on the new hydraulic phase field fracture model that we proposed. The state of the art of modeling hydraulic phase field fracture is to enhance the permeability inside the crack, which is based on the cubic law. <coughs> As summarized in this table, our new model uses Stokes equation to model fracture flow, while other models adopt Darcy's law by enhancing the permeability along the crack. Also, our new model is capable of explicitly modeling the friction at the crack surface. Permeability enhancement approach implicitly models it by idealizing fracture as two smooth parallel walls. We compared the difference between two models by solving boundary value problem that look, looks like this. We applied tensile loading on the top of the square domain that has a initial notch at the middle. By using the same material parameters, two models yield same fracture patterns, but our stokes darcy model had lower peak stress compared to permeability enhancement approach. This is because in our approach, fluid pressure inside the fracture remains low, while higher negative pressure builds up in surrounding Darcy's region compared to, compared to the permeability enhancement approach. As illustrated in this figure, this is because the Stokes region can be interpreted as a region that has more than 100 times higher permeability, so that the pore fluid tends to flow into crack more faster, which leads to higher negative pore pressure and higher effective stress that eventually causes the crack to propagate at relatively lower load levels. Another important thing to notice is that during hydraulic fracture process, the flow inside the fracture is not a clear fluid flow. This means that we should consider it as a suspension flow, and in order to capture more realistic behavior, we additionally use the concept of effective viscosity, which considers the fluid viscosity as a function of particle concentration, which again depends on the porosity. In this study, we adopted the effective viscosity model proposed by Mooney in 1951 by assuming that particle concentration depends on the amount of porosity increment. In order to explore the effective, effective viscosity, we repeated the same boundary valid problem by using Mooney's effective viscosity model. And we observed that the material response remains the same because meaningful amount, of, meaningful amount of increase of porosity only occurs inside the damaged zone so that the simulation results with effective viscosity model tends to yield slower fracture flow velocity after crack initiation without affecting the effective stress in the undamaged matrix. In summary, we proposed a new approach for the dual porosity system which considers hydromechanical coupling effects in Stokes RC system. Also, by extending this model, we were able to propose a new model for hydraulic fracture, which is capable of explicitly modeling the friction at the crack interface. 
based on the study, I was able to be equipped with dual porosity system with different flow regimes, which can be used to model frozen soil. Now I'll talk about the next step, which is about the thermal hydromechanics for ruggy porous media under thermal non-equilibrium condition. And this is important in phase transition in frozen soil at small time scales. Geological CO2 injection and geothermal energy recovery are the examples where heat transfer process is dominated by convection process if we focus on small lengths and time scales. The classical approach to model heat transfer in geological materials is to assume thermally equilibrated condition which homogenizes the entire temperature field inside the RVE. However, this approach may not be accurate for the small time and length scales, especially in convection dominated case where fluid flow inside the pores are relatively fast. Therefore, this study assumes that solid and fluid constituents are thermal are in thermal non-equilibrium condition meaning that we are going to homogenize it in different way and consider solid and fluid temperatures separately in order to model the porous media under thermal non-equilibrium condition we need two governing equations that describe solid and fluid temperature evolutions for the solid part, we have structural heating term and conduction term, whereas the fluid part has convection and conduction terms. And these two equations are coupled with the heat exchange term here, where this ASF is the specific surface area and HSF is the heat exchange coefficient. Based on these two equations, solid temperature TS and fluid temperature TF can be equilibrated if ASF or HSF becomes infinitely large. Assuming that HF, HSF goes to infinity, then summation of these two equations yields classical one temperature model which possesses only one homogenized temperature T at each material point. We conducted a set of numerical experiments to check if our two temperature model can be reduced to one temperature model as the heat exchange coefficient becomes larger. Um, we first simulated a conduction dominant case in a 1D domain by applying 30 degrees Celsius solid temperature on the left while initial solid and fluid temperatures are set to be 20 degrees Celsius. In these figures, the dashed line indicates the classical one temperature model, whereas lines with symbols indicate two temperature model results with different heat exchange coefficients. Um, as you can see, um, as heat exchange coefficient increases, we observe that there exists only a marginal difference between two temperatures, which means that when modeling heat conduction in materials that have large heat exchange coefficient, we can consider using one temperature model instead of two temperature model. However, in convection dominant case, we found that one temperature approach is no longer valid. In this case, we injected a 30 degrees Celsius fluid into a 20 degrees Celsius 1D bar. And as you can see, two constituents become thermally equilibrated if the heat exchange coefficient is unrealistically large. Our results show that the classical one temperature model is not capable of modeling detailed heat transfer mechanisms when it's convection dominated. And for the materials that possess large pores, the results also imply that we should consider thermal non-equilibrium approach rather than using one temperature model. We further extend this concept in order to model the buggy pores media by using the same concept that we discussed in previous session. So inside the VUGS, we modeled fluid flow with Stokes equation, whereas in the pores matrix, we used the Darcy's law. In this case, the thermal convection now depends on fluid flows in both Stokes and Darcy regions. 
Furthermore, if we set the porosity to be 1 and specific surface to be infinitely large for the Vuggy region, the fluid flow inside Stoke region can be viewed as a clear fluid flow, meaning that we can consider thermal equilibrium condition inside the Vug, whereas porous matrix remains thermally non-equilibrated condition. This numerical example shows the heat transfer process in rigid Vuggy porous media. Our domain consists of flow channel which is intercepted by the porous matrix. We injected a 20 degrees Celsius water into the Vuggy region on the left while the initial temperature, initial temperature of the entire domain is set to be 10 degrees Celsius. The result shows that the solid and fluid temperature inside the Vugs are in thermal equilibrium while at the porous matrix fluid temperature tends to rise more rapidly due to the heat convection and solid temperature rises in relatively slow manner due to the heat exchange. This example shows that we are now capable of modeling complex heat transfer processes in dual porosity system where the fluid tends to flow faster inside the vugs compared to the porous matrix. We also explored the thermal hydromechanical coupling effects by conducting this numerical example. Our rectangular computational domain has a defect in the lower right part where this small region is the only way for the fluid to escape this domain. In order to simulate the thermal contraction, we applied 0 degrees Celsius solid temperature at the top while initial temperatures of the domain is set to be 20 degrees Celsius. These results show that shows the um, solid displacement, fluid temperature, fluid pressure, solid temperature, and fluid temperature changes during the numerical experiment. At the beginning, due to the structural heating term, the high pore pressure tends to build up due to the thermal contraction near the top boundary. And then, consolidation process takes place so that the entire specimen tends to contract more due to the dissipation of pore pressure. We also conducted another simulation without this defect in order to investigate the effect of the bug. Um, these four figures show the displacement, pressure, and solid fluid temperature changes at the center point of the domain. Since the heat transfer process is mainly driven by solid heat conduction, we observed no temperature difference between two cases. However, existence of the Vuggy defect results in different displacement and pressure responses. At the beginning, the center point of the specimen tends to move upward due to the thermal contraction, which causes fluid pressure to be increased. And then it starts to move downwards as fluid starts to escape by dissipating the pore pressure. Because of the defect, fluid inside the pores matrix tends to escape faster compared to the case without defect, resulting in lower pressure buildup and eventually more negative solid displacement. In summary, we proposed a thermohydromechanically coupled model for Vuggy pores media by adopting the dual porosity concept. In this section, we model thermal non-equilibrium conditions so that our model is capable of simulating detailed heat transfer processes by, while considering the microstructure. Based on the study, I was able to be equipped with two temperature models which can be used to model frozen soil that requires thermal non-equilibrium concept during the veins transition. Finally, I want to talk about the future work. The final goal of my PhD study, which is about modeling ice growth in geological materials. By revisiting the introduction session, now I got the tools that will be used to model ice growth. From the studies that we discussed in previous sections, I was able to model higher order continuum, dual porosity system, and porous media under non-equilibrium condition. The one last thing that I need is to model the phase transition process which may yield this beautiful patterns. 
my current status for this current status for this work remains in the state of preliminary study study where I was able to simulate temperature dependent crystal growth by adopting the model proposed by Demond et al. in 2017. This model simulates the snowflake growth in supersaturated atmosphere and has two governing equations where the prime variables are the phase field and reduced supersaturation of water vapor that depends on the temperature T. In this model, there are numerical parameters that controls the crystal growth pattern. Um, this L set is the rate of water depletion in vapor and epsilon XY and epsilon Z are the anisotropy constants and gamma is the parameter that governs the preference between vertical and horizontal growth. Um, based on Demange's work, the combination of these parameters decide the overall pattern of the snow crystal growth. As an example, I was able to generate different patterns of snow crystals by using different L-set parameters. As you can see, the nice thing about this model is the capability of generating multiple different patterns by simply controlling the numerical parameters. Based on this preliminary study, my future plan is to extend this model into a model that simulates ice crystal growth inside the geological materials. In summary, in order to model ice growth inside geological material, my plan is to use micropolar theory to consider micro micromechanics of the frozen soil and consider different flow regimes in frozen and unfrozen regions by using dual porosity concept and adopt thermal non-equilibrium concept to simulate detailed heat transfer between the constituents and finally work on the phase field model that can replicate the ice growth pattern inside the pores by extending, extending the model proposed by Demond et al. These are the references that I use for this presentation. And thank you for listening.